Well, good evening. It's good to see you tonight. Let's uh, go ahead and get started. Welcome our internet congregation. And uh, it's good to see you this evening, this Wednesday night. Have our Awanas and our youth uh, going on. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, to uh, come into your presence, we're so grateful. Lord, we thank you for everything you do in our life. Many of the things that you do, that you protect us from, guide us through. Uh, God goes, sometimes even unnoticeable to us, Lord, because sometimes we take you for granted. The fact that we woke up this morning, God, uh, we sometimes take for granted. The fact that we are going to, uh, Lord willing, be alive to lay our head down tonight to go to sleep. Uh, Lord, we just do pray for our WANAs and our, our youth ministries, as well as uh, our church service here as we go back into the book of Revelation. God, we pray that whatever age group we find ourselves in this evening, or whether we are watching from uh, television there in our living rooms, I pray, God, that you would speak to our heart through your word. And Lord, we pray for that person today that needs Christ as their Savior. Lord, may today be that day that they invite Christ into their heart. And God, will thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, it is good to see you this evening. Uh, Francis isn't here this evening, so we will forego uh, the singing tonight. And so we'll go into our announcements, and then we'll just go ahead and enter into our, uh, our Bible study tonight. Good to have Brother Lonnie back with us. He's all ready to sing. He was fired up, but Francis is uh, unable to be here this evening. So we'll hold uh, Lonnie. He'll be uh, leading music this weekend, so it's good to have him back with us. Uh, thank Glenn for filling in during his absence. I don't know if you picked it up on your way in or not. If you didn't, you can get it on your way out. But there is a chart. I'll go over it after we get back into the book of Revelation. There's a resurrection chart here back there on that table next to your outlines. If you picked that up, that's fine. If you didn't, you can get it on your way out. Uh, then Senior Citizens Day, there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Uh, and I'll just read it. On Tuesday, October the 19th, seniors ages 65 and older get free admission to the state fair. Uh, they can also enjoy a free Bojangles biscuit. You can't beat that combination. Uh, and entertainment at the Senior Citizen Fun Festival. So um, this is actually, I think, a joint church effort, uh, also along with uh, Randolph Adventist Association. So it says that we will depart from the Randolph Mall parking lot behind Dedham Sporting Goods at 7.30 a.m. All right, 7.30 a.m. So if you're interested in going uh, to that state fair on October the 19th, uh, then you can sign up on the sheet back there in the foyer. All right? And the, do what? You won't. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, it, they'll trust you for it. Uh, and then also there is the uh, family update contact info on the table back there as well. There's a basket. If you would, update your family's information here so Tammy can update our records in the office. Some uh, phone numbers have changed. Some email addresses have changed. Even some addresses have actually changed. And so if you would, uh, go ahead and... Update your information as soon as you can, please. Uh, and then also, um, this coming Sunday night, uh, immediately after service, we have a special call business meeting to approve the nominations for 2021-2022. All right, and so that's all this business meeting will take place. Uh, it shouldn't be but a few minutes. Uh, here is the ballot, okay? The ballot is ready. It's back there on the foyer if you'd like to pick one up on your way out, all right? So we're going to give you, uh, you know, tonight and also Sunday morning, they'll be available. However, uh, there is one thing left off, at least on this one. It will be added on Sunday, okay? But if you pick this up, all right, just know that down here, uh, they accidentally left off. Uh, we started, obviously, you see a welcoming center little thing out there, a greeter. Uh, Beth Pugh is going to be our new greeter coordinator, so if you want to write in yes and no greeter coordinator Beth Pugh, uh, then this part will be complete Sunday morning. If you pick up a new one, uh, it will have that on it. Okay, so she's going to be the greeter coordinator. All right, and that is Beth Pugh. 
Also, I would say that uh, there are three, and what they are, I don't know that I can name all three of them, so it really doesn't matter what they are. There are three open positions that our nominating committee are still trying to fill, okay? Not on this sheet, all right, but there are three open positions positions that they're still trying to fill, but what we're going to do is go ahead and approve what they already have, okay, uh, because these teachers and everything, uh, if there's any kind of new officers on here, uh, Sunday morning that correction will be typed in, okay. Anybody got any questions on that? All right, if you got any questions that you can think of between now and the end of the service, just jot it down. You can ask me after, after the service tonight. And then notice also in your bulletin, uh, the quote of the week is by Corey Tim Boom, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Uh, it's so very true. None of us know the future, but we certainly know God. And he is trustworthy. And oh, to God that we could be as trustworthy to him as he, are to, uh, as he is to us. But uh, so thankful for his faithfulness. Uh, then also on here, uh, again, it mentions the uh, business meeting immediately following the Sunday night service. Uh, in fact, the, in relation to the business meeting that we had this past Sunday night, we're already looking at ice machines, uh, so we're, we're getting prices together for that. Uh, we uh, also, George, uh, the associate pastor at Balfour, uh, deals with used uh, cars, but also with uh, church vans and various things. He's got one coming available in October that is a 15-passenger van with an aisle in it that he is going to hold for us to at least look at. So uh, we already are in the process of acting on what came up in the meeting uh, this past Sunday night. Uh, Minister of Music and Youth, uh, we have a search committee meeting Sunday at 4.30, so if you're on that, please uh, make sure you note that. I did send out an email a few days ago. Uh, in case you did not get that, if you did not get that, let me know, okay? Also, there is a box in the foyer. We're having a fall festival uh, Saturday, October the 30th from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. We got floatables, inflatables, floatables. <laughs> we got inflatables coming. Uh, we're looking at having a full-blown uh, fall festival. There's a sign-up sheet out there if you would like to participate in that and also uh, run a game, all right? And whatever game you're going to do, or man, if you would write that game on that sheet as well, all right? But we got a box out there already collecting candy for that, okay? As far as I know, that is all our announcements, all right? And if I could think of anything else, I'll mention it during the prayer time, all right? Uh, I would say this, that if you do have a prayer need, go ahead and fill out that prayer card. We'll collect that at the end of the service right before we go into our prayer time, all right? Well, with that said, go ahead and take your Bibles. And for the first time in the book of Revelation, I can say, open up to Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. Hope you have your outline with you tonight. And then also this sheet, okay? I may just run... Um, well, there's actually a chart that Dave enlarged. I'll show you that momentarily. But uh, I may run that chart for you next week just so you'll have it. But uh, as far as this goes, as you know, uh, two Wednesdays ago now, it came up about resurrections and judgments and glorified bodies. And while this does not specifically address after the millennium that we addressed last week, this is a basic chart of the various resurrections, all right? It's got your Old Testament. It's got um, the present church age. It's got the rapture. It's got the second coming of Christ. And between those two things is the tribulation, which we're looking at. And then it's got the millennial reign of Christ. And then actually, <clears throat> it does have, after that, uh, the non-Christians are resurrected unto judgment. That is Revelation chapter 20. Okay, and then uh, there at the end also, those who are converted in the millennium, we believe, gets their new uh, glorified bodies in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 5. If you recall from last week, we said where God makes all things new. All right, well, with that said, okay, 
Revelation chapter 8, and what this actually does is chapter 8 is going to run through chapter 9. All right, so, and I'm not going to read all of chapter 9 tonight, but I do at least want to begin reading chapter 8 and into chapter 9 a little bit. And there's really not a good place to stop in chapter 9, but we'll just listen to what's going to happen from here on out. Everything's going to escalate in intensity and also in frequency. All right, so notice here in chapter 8 and verse 1, we have an odd beginning. Okay. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of an half an hour. So for whatever reason, he opens that seal and heaven is silent for 30 minutes. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And so now we are getting into the trumpet judgments. The judgments that come after the trumpet would be the bowl judgments. We just finished the seal judgments. The seventh seal is not a judgment, and I'll go over that momentarily. The seventh seal is not a judgment in itself like the other six was. It is the, literally a seal that contains the next seven judgments. So what we believe is when he opens up the seventh seal, that contains seven trumpet judgments. And when you get to the seven trumpet judgment, the seventh one, it contains the seven bowl judgments. All right? And so notice, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar. Now picture, John is seeing this. And this angel has a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. This entails not only all the prayers of the saints, we believe, from Revelation chapter 6, the martyred souls under the Bible, when they cried, How long, O God? Uh, not only them, but basically every prayer that's ever been prayed, looking forward to what's coming. All right? So notice. With much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. And so these prayers in the form of this incense is literally smoke is rising basically into the nostrils of God. And the Bible says, and the angel took the censer and he filled it with fire of the altar. And notice that he cast it into, uh, and if you've got a King James Bible, you know there in the center column, it's got a reference there, literally onto the earth. So he, he has this golden censer. He fills it with embers, coals of fire here. And the Bible says that he filled it with fire of the altar, and he cast it, he hurls it down unto the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. And the first angel sounded. And keep in mind, this is not the trumpet, this is not the trump of God that's going to rapture the redeemed home. This is a judgment trumpet. The first angel sounded, and there followed hell and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and a third part of the trees was burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. So this first trumpet judgment is literally going to affect the earth itself. Notice the Bible says that hell and fire mingled with blood, was cast upon the earth, and a third part of the trees was burned up. Can you imagine a third part of all the trees? This is not a localized event. It is worldwide. And all the green grass was burned up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. 
And the third part of the sea became blood. And a will whatever crash and sink. And you also got to imagine that on that was a lot of commercialism and cargo and freight. And so that's going to be uh, an economic impact as well. All right, food impact leading to the famine as well. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were uh, like a lamp or a torch, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of the waters. And so now we're talking about fresh water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. We'll get into that later, probably not tonight, I don't know, but that word means bitter. They literally became bitter and they were no good for human consumption. And many men died of the waters. Evidently they tried to drink that and, and they died because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded. And a third part of the sun was smitten. And a third part of the moon and a third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened. And the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise. You know, if you read a lot of books and if you read some commentaries, one of the things that you don't read necessarily into this is obviously a consequence of this when the third part of the day is literally going to be dark when it would be light. That can lead to all kinds of problems, one of them being depression. Depression and, and various things like that it affects us not only physically but mentally and emotionally. I mean, the sun should be shining, but it's not, all right? So darkness. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, now keep in mind, that was the fourth trumpet, the fourth angel. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice. Now notice this repetition, woe, woe, woe. We would call that the three woes, obviously, all right? But woe to the inhabitants of the earth. That is those that are there that have obviously uh, refused to identify with Christ. They have received the mark of the beast to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. So what he says is, you think it's bad right now. It's not even gotten bad. He says, woe, 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 by reason of the three angels that have yet to sound. There are three more trumpets to go. So notice chapter 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw, and by the way, the fifth angel obviously would be the first woe, if you're going woe, 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 three woes, the first, the fifth angel would represent the first woe, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened, now picture this, uh, the bottomless pit would be an incarceration of the demonic spirit, uh, spirits, the demons, okay, notice, and he had this key to the bottomless pit. He opened it, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts. Now I want you to keep in mind because the description upon these locusts helps us to understand that they're really not actual locusts themselves. Okay? Notice. Locusts upon the earth, actually they are demonic uh, spirits. And unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them, now get this, it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth. We'll stop right there. What does locusts devour? Vegetation, grass, trees, and all. So it's not necessarily, it's not really locusts itself. All right, you'll see through the description. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth. Now keep in mind, they are like scorpions. Should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but get this, only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Well, locusts like demonic, but it's not locusts, okay? These demons, 
And to them it was given, get this, that they should not kill them. Listen, they're going to torture people that have not received the mark of God in their foreheads. They're going to torture them, but not kill them. But it's going to be so painful that they're going to wish they were dead. Notice, and to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. Five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion. Now, I don't know if you've ever been stung by a scorpion, but if you lived in Florida, chances are you have. Okay? I mean, it, literally. But they were really small, and they pale in comparison to a scorpion. But I'm here to tell you, you learn not to leave your shoes on your bedroom floor. Okay? Because you, or your bedroom slippers. You get up in the middle of the night, and you could literally put your feet into your slippers, and there would be a little scorpion about that long. And you know what? He's going to sting you. Okay? And it's... It, it, it basically is equivalent to a bee sting, okay? It, to me, though, that hurts, okay? Especially when it's at the tip of your toe, all right? This is not them, okay? This is the full-blown scorpion, all right? Uh, when it strikes the man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them, and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses. And each one of these descriptions that I give you has an, uh, it's indicative of something that we won't cover tonight. But they had the shape like a horse prepared unto battle. I mean, they were formidable. Okay, if you've ever seen a horse uh, in the movies that has been arrayed for battle by the Romans or whatever it is, I mean, they've got armor on them as well. And on their heads was as it were like crowns like gold. That gives authority and power. And their faces, now get this, were as the faces of a man, as of men. But we're not done yet, notice. And they had hair as the hair of women. And their teeth as the teeth of lions. I mean, these were some sightly things, right? Now, listen, is that what they're actually going to look like Probably not. Keep in mind, this is, this is John's description of what he's seeing. And he says, best I can tell, man, those teeth look like teeth of a lion. That speaks of ferocity. And then notice, and they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. Listen, you're not going to be able to kill them. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. That means they were innumerable. And they had tails like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails, and their power or authority was to hurt men without that mark five months. And notice they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. In the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. That's just one woe. Notice in verse 12. One woe is past, behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Well, we're not going to continue to read, all right, through chapter 9, but you can literally read through chapter 9, and it gets worse if you think it could get worse. It gets worse, okay? Uh, but literally, you think about it, you know, how many could be in this army of demons that are unleashed from the bottomless pit? Well, just real quick, if you look in chapter 9 and verse 16, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number, and that's roughly 200 million. That's a lot. All right. Well, let's go back to chapter 8. Chapter 8. You've got to keep in mind that while there's no scriptural indication that this is true, I would have to say this, that people ask me all the time, well, those in heaven, are they aware of what goes on earth? If you've got loved ones that are in heaven now, are they aware of what's going on down here? Do they see us? You know, my, my answer has always been captured, and we receive our glorified bodies. We are told... In the book of Revelation at the end, and we've already noticed in chapter 7 and verse 17, the last part of that verse, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. 
We know that doesn't take place until Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, where God wipes away the tears. And so, are there going to be tears in heaven? Evidently there is, all right? What are those tears? We don't know, okay? It could be one of three things. It could be all of the three things. Uh, one, it could be as we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ uh, at the judgment seat of Christ, we're not judged for our sin, we're judged for our service, and we may literally cry because we could have served Him a lot more faithfully than what we did. Yes? You know, uh, when, when you so you're saying, uh, are they going to be able to see anything that what John is saying is taking place right now? Secondly, okay, secondly, all right, going back to what Mike just said and what I said earlier, while I don't know there's any scriptural indication uh, where the saints on, in heaven are interactive with the activity on earth, we do know there are tears in heaven during this time of the tribulation. All right? Now, can it be that when we stand before Christ and we do not hear the words, Well done, thy good and faithful servant, and we don't have any crowns to lay at his feet, would we share, shed tears? Well, I would believe we would. Okay? But also, I believe that it would be a tearful time um, at the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20 where all the dead that died without Christ are resurrected and they stand before God and literally they are judged out of their books and their names are not found written in the book of the life and they are cast into the lake of fire. I believe we are going to be able to see that. I believe we're going to see that. I believe, we're going to, it's going, I believe it's going to be visible to us and some of those may very well be our loved ones. Some of those may be our friends that we should have witnessed to. Some of them may be some of our loved ones and our friends that we did witness to, and they said no. And we may very well be shedding tears over that. The other would be, Mike, it's very possible that we are in heaven during this time, and it may very well be that we are knowledgeable of what's going on here during this time. And also, it will affect our family members. Now, it may not affect our family members that are living now. It depends on when the rapture is. But let's face it. You know, eventually, it's going to be family members. We don't know how far down, but it's going to be family members. Uh, and so, could it be those three? Yes. Could it be one of those three? Yes. Could it be none of those three? Yes. We don't know. Uh, I believe, basically, all three. That's just where I'm at. I believe that we're going to shed some tears when we stand before Christ, the one that we could have served more faithfully, and we didn't. I believe we're going to shed tears when we see our loved ones and our friends that we should have warned and that we did warn and they refused going through what they're going through here. Uh, literally, when they buy in to the mark of the beast. And then I believe that we will shed tears at the great white throne of judgment when we see our loved ones or friends or whoever. And let me just say this. It doesn't even have to be our loved ones and our friends because we are, in reality, while we are thankful that God is going to repay the wicked, if you recall, it's going to be sweet in our mouth but bitter in our stomach. You know, sweet in that God's going to repay wickedness. Bitter in that in reality, though, we don't want to see anybody die and go to hell. And so, you know what? Even the people that we've never known, we may shed tears over when we see what they're literally going to be exposed. Or we don't, no. It's silent, okay? Uh, part of heaven may be seeing what you escaped. I just don't know. I just don't know. Okay. Uh, therefore, you know, we are to warn people, uh, not of the judgment that's coming, but of the love of God that paid their sin debt. You know, it's the love of God, the Bible says, that draw men unto repentance. It's not the fear of hell that should be a deterrent 
It should be the love of God that's attractive. You know, when you find out, if you really, if you can really understand how sinful you are and how lost you are and your future, if you can ever comprehend that as a person without Christ and then understand the debt that you owe to God and then find out that Christ paid your debt, that love that He displayed to you should attract you to Christ is basically what the Bible tells us. It's the love of God that draws men to repentance. So, uh, and let's face it, nobody will get saved until they see their sinfulness, you know, and convicted of it. And say, so, well, you know what, I don't want to die and go to hell. And you, I, I mean, Christ died so that I don't have to die? Well, when you look at this in chapter 8, this is the beginning of the day of the Lord, Okay the last half of the tribulation period where we have gone through literally, you know, the birth pains, okay, that we've talked about. You know, there's been judgments already. The four horsemen have ridden in. There's been famine and all these things. In fact, you know, the first five seals, there's the false peace, there's the famine, there's the war, there's the death, and then that um, sixth one, uh, we believe to be vengeance, meaning uh, the prayers of the saints under the altar where they cry out to God for vengeance, that vengeance being that one, all of that will pale in comparison to the judgments that lead up to an outpouring of the divine wrath of God during this last half and which we would characterize as the day of the Lord. Okay, They pale in comparison to what is coming down the road. Um, when we look at this, uh, and I give you, uh, there's a chart. Uh, Dave, if you could, go ahead and pull that up. Um, this is a parallel, and, and I may, you might not be able to see it good. Um, and I may just run this little chart here for you next week. But this is the trumpets. We just read of those, okay? And we stopped. We didn't go all the way to chapter 11, obviously, okay? But if you were to read it, okay, the trumpet judgment's in the blue, all right? The recipient of the judgment, it affects the earth. Remember, a, a third part is burned up and all the grass, okay? Then the next one, the sea, a third part of the sea. The next one, the rivers, remember wormwood, okay? Uh, the heavens, uh, we, you know, we read that. Mankind, uh, if they didn't have the, uh, the seal of God in their foreheads. We didn't get all the way to that one, but the army and the Euphrates, the Euphrates River will be dried up. That will pave the way for the armies to assemble in the valley of Armageddon. And then also in uh, Revelation chapter 11, the nations in wrath. When you go to the vials, which is also called the bowl judgments, they are kind of, they parallel these, all right? Uh, it will affect, you know, the, the men on the earth. It will affect various, uh, it will be indicative of what the trumpet judgments, uh, judgments affected, but much more intense, much more intense. It's going to affect the same thing the trumpets did, but on a whole new level. Okay, so you, I'll give you this parallel next week, all right? Or you can snap a picture of it with your cell phone there probably. Um, but yeah, when you see that the trumpet judgment affected that, and you look at the parallel vile judgment, it will affect that too, but much more intense, all right? When you get through into the tribulation period, the first three and a half years, you know you'll have this one. And then we don't know how much longer before you got the other judgment, you know, the seal. Then we don't know how much longer before you got the third seal and the fourth seal and the fifth seal and the sixth seal. All right, there's a space there because it spans into the last three and a half. When you get into this one, all right, all of these judgments will take place in the last three and a half years. And not only will they uh, speed up, in frequency. Uh, some of the writers, John MacArthur would say this, you know, it may start out that judgments are months apart. 
And then, you know, you get into the second half of the tribulation, they would be a month apart, a, a couple of weeks apart, a week apart, uh, you know, days apart, literally hours apart. Uh, and the reason is because it's like the birth pains of a woman. Remember, we read that scripture in Matthew 24. You know, Joyce, I mean, I, she was in labor so long, I thought I could just go on home. My Marine Corps uh, career would have been over before <laughs> the first one was born. I mean, literally, like, I don't know, 18 hours or something. Uh, but, you know, the second one, uh, well, let me just go back to that. You know, the birth pains, I mean, they were, you know, mild to begin with. She wouldn't tell you that. But anyway, they were really far apart, far apart, far apart. They started getting closer, and the closer they got, the more intense they got. And then finally, right before that child was born, they were literally one on top of the other, and the intensity of it was off the scale. And then the child was born. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. Okay? They're going to be spaced apart, spaced apart, and the closer we get to the end, the closer they're going to be together, and the more intense they're going to be. When you get to the ultimate intensity of them, you will be in the vile judgments. If you hear me talk about the bold judgments, that's the vile, the vile judgments, all right? So let's just look at this real quick, all right? We've only got a couple of minutes, but we've covered a lot already just in reading this. But I, I want you to notice as you start there in your outlines, you've got the details that precede the trumpet judgment, all right? What is this pause in heaven? Why? When you look back, and you look into chapter 6 and verse 1, he says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, a noise of thunder. And one of the beasts say, Come and see. And then as you continue to read, heaven is not silent. But when you open up this seventh seal, which is literally the first trumpet judgment, heaven is quiet. And why is that? Why did all activity stop? Well, notice there's a pause in heaven, and then there's silence. Silence for 30 minutes as this parenthesis or this interlude of chapter 7 ends, and the devastation of chapter 8 begins. All right? And, and some people believe that as he breaks that seal, and the people in heaven are made aware of, of what that seal contains, there's no words. There's just no words. Not only is it a reverential awe, you know, but basically it's an anxious suspense. It's like it's jaw-dropping as to see what's going to happen. Uh, John MacArthur really offers a good perspective on this, and we'll close with him. He says, but after all that loudness, you know, the, the angels crying and, and you know, uh, the four and twenty elders falling down and saying, Amen, and glory unto him that sitteth upon the throne, all these things, the thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes, all of this. He says, but after all that loudness, as the full fury of the final judgments is about to be released, Silence falls on the heavenly scene. Now listen, we're up there. The activity that John sees going on is us. The full fury of the final judgments is about to be released. Silence falls on the heavenly scene. The implication is that when the judgment about to happen becomes visible, storm. It is the silence or of foreboding that is a fearful apprehension of intense expectation of awe at what God is about to do. You know, I don't know if you've ever witnessed something that was just absolutely astonishing, astounding, and, and just unbelievable, and you just, like this, uh, that's what I'm picturing. I mean, that's just what I'm picturing. As the Lamb opens up that seventh seal, which contains the first trumpet, and the redeemed and the angels began to look upon what's going to be coming down the pike to those on earth, 
we're speechless. Speechless. Well, we will go ahead and end there. I'm going to tell you, none of this did I know the day I got saved. And the reason I say that to say this is all of this that we're going through now, I knew nothing about. So this was not a deterrent for me that said, you know what, I need to receive Christ as my Savior. I don't think any of you knew any of this before you got saved. And this is not why we got saved. Well, you know what? I don't want to go through the tribulation period. I'm going to give my life to Christ. I mean, that's not why. You know, we got saved because we've seen ourselves as a sinner. God convicted us of our sin, and somebody shared the plan of salvation with us, and that our pen, sin penalty had been paid for. Our debt was wiped clean. All we had to do was receive Him as Savior and walk with Him. Uh, that's what attracted us. And then, you know, once we find out what's going to be happening, how can we not warn those? Now, do we warn them by saying, you know what, Charlie, if you don't get saved today, you're going to go into the tribulation period. But we don't do that. But because we know what is in store for them, we should share with them the love of God. You know, Charlie, Christ died for your sin. You know, that not only would you one day live with him, but that you would begin to live your life for him here. You know, you go through the plan of salvation. What we're reading about now doesn't even come into play. You know, trust me, Charlie, you really need to give your life to Christ because you don't want the mark of the beast. We don't do that, you know. Besides, that would be confusing to him, you know. So what we do, what do we do? Charlie, you're a sinner. And the penalty of sin is death. But Christ paid your sin debt. That's what we do. Why do we do it? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible says the love of God constrains us to do it. But also, we do that because we care for them. And we do that because we don't want them to go where God is not. So... Any questions? Comment?